the history of Dallas Theological Seminary and that of Bible Study Fellowship go way back. Uh, one of our uh, board members who is now with the Lord, Bill Garrison, served on uh, the board of Bible Study Fellowship for many years and uh, helped uh, bring some connection. Uh, we have had faculty members and uh, administrators in the past who have uh, helped train uh, Bible study leader uh, teachers and staff in their uh, summer uh, training sessions, and uh, that has gone on for a number of years. Dr. Uh, Hendricks, Dr. Campbell, uh, Dr. Hanna has done it uh, uh, many, many times. And it's been my privilege the last number of years to serve on the board of Bible Study Fellowship, and that's been a, a real joy. Our speaker is a, a lady we've come to love and appreciate uh, for her gifts, for her heart for God, for her leadership of Bible Study Fellowship uh, during these last number of years as well. Susie Rowan is the executive director for BSF, originally from Kansas City. She graduated from the University of Kansas and the University of Missouri-Kansas City School of Law practice law for a number of years. With the birth of her children, her work life was reduced to allow her to parent and serve the Lord uh, in Bible Study Fellowship, a global in-depth Bible study ministry. Many of you have heard about it. She assumed the leadership of uh, BSF in 2009, and she enjoys life with her husband, Roger, whom you met a few minutes ago, who is an essential part of uh, her ministry and ours. Uh, their favorite activities revolve around two married adult children and their spouses and three uh, grandchildren. The Kansas City Jayhawks, <laughs> some of you, that's okay, and a little white ball known as a golf ball. They love to do that as well. Uh, Susie, thank you for being a godly woman. Thank you for your faithfulness, your friendship. Would you join me in welcoming a dear friend, Susie Rowland. Well, sometimes I ask for a box to stand on up here, so <laughs> I'm a little smaller than this pulpit, but um, it, is, it is a delight to be here. It is such um, a, a wonderful moment to look out at your faces and realize that you have been involved in ministry for many years. Uh, as those of you who are students, you're be, you're preparing for future ministry as well, probably many of you in the midst of already very involved in ministry, and then to look at your faculty members and think of how they have poured into the entire Christian world, and particularly to all of you. So it's a great encouragement to see your faces and to be here today. And so I thank you, Mark, for inviting me to come. I thank you also for your leadership on our board of directors. Uh, he is also involved in the oversight of the Bible study materials that we produce. And so we're very grateful for him, very grateful for this man here on the front row, Dr. John Hanna, who has taught our, our teachers for a very long time and also poured himself into our materials. And there are many others on this staff who have contributed and you know, I'm also really, really thankful for the opportunities that God has given me as a woman to be involved in ministry, to teach the Word of God for decades, and now to be uh, the leader of Bible Study Fellowship. I am so grateful. And so while I'm grateful for you, I'm grateful to God for the opportunities that He's given to me and the future opportunities that will come to you. But for those of us in this room who've been in ministry for a very long time, we understand the strain of ministry. And so based upon my own experience, uh, and I'm sure the experience that others have shared with you from your faculty and staff, I wanna just talk to you today about the strain of ministry and then talk about some survival solutions for you. So with that in mind, um, I just wanna pray to ask God to help me, okay? <laughs> Heavenly Father, um, you know, I just always feel a little strained when I stand uh, uh, in front of people to talk. And I uh, so just present that to you as one of the strains of ministry. Thank you that you are sufficient in all the strains and that you have um, seen me through and still see me through. And so, Lord, as I speak out of my own heart and my own experience about your faithfulness, um, would you help everyone who is listening? I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Seems real appropriate that during Passion Week that we would be talking about the strain of ministry. I mean, when did the height of ministry strain happen other than in 
the Passion Week of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Lord felt more strain than we will ever feel. And you know, his disciples felt plenty of strain too, didn't, didn't they? I mean, if you remember the story, of course, you all know they fled, didn't they? The strain of ministry was just too much for them, just too much for them. But then came the resurrection, Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and everything changed, didn't it? Everything changed. And so what happened to Christ's followers after that? Well, Revelation 12, 11 describes it this way. They triumphed by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not shrink back, not even from death. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink back from death. And so the strain of ministry is real, but the victory that the Lord Jesus Christ gives in the midst of that strain is real as well. Paul, writing uh, from a prison cell, knew about ministry strain. And so though I'm not going to exposit a passage, teach a passage this morning, I just wanted to read a little portion of uh, the letter to Colossians, beginning with chapter 1, verse 24. And there are a few things that I'm going to refer to as I talk about the strain of ministry. Paul writes from prison to the church in Colossae. Verse 1, chapter 1, verse 24. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, teaching and admonishing everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. To this end, writes Paul, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one will deceive you with fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in the body, Paul was in prison, not in Colossae, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. What a beautiful passage about ministry strain contending with all the energy that Christ so powerfully worked in Paul. Now, ministry strain takes a lot of different forms. And of course, they're all rooted in sin, aren't they? I mean, that's just, that's why we sang about the blood. Thanks be for the blood. So there's conflict, there's family pressures, there's job, financial health, all those issues. Opposition comes from the enemies within us and the enemies that oppose us from without. So ministry strain comes in a lot of different ways, and I'm gonna to talk to you about three of them today. The one is the strain of culture. The second is the strain of just regular church ministry or counseling ministry or whatever ministry you may be involved in. And lastly, I wanna talk particularly to the women in this room about the strain for women in ministry. So that's where I'm going, and I'm just going to start with the cultural topic, the strain of culture, and I think you're going to see a video here on the screen. The greatest refugee crisis of the Second World War. I can't believe it's 2017 already. Wow. When I really sit in my room and I'm alone and I can just like, God, are you there? Like, I feel this connection with something that's a higher being. It was the interview heard round the world. For all intents and purposes, I am a woman. Although evacuations in eastern Aleppo have restarted, many thousands remain. A simple way to define spirituality is self-awareness, period. These Christian militiamen have just come home 
after two years in forced exile. I'm going to put the cross on the church. Watch this, Daesh. I'm going to put it on the church. A new CBS News poll finds that for the first time, a slim majority of Americans believe that marijuana should be legal. You can hear the cheer in the crowd. A very dramatic moment here, a 5-4 decision. This is a, a total victory for the advocates of same-sex marriage. And this is why, especially religious conservative Christians, have really made a mess of the Bible. The people who talk about the Bible have made the biggest mess of it. And here I think is why. I think all spiritual sort of teaching basically aiming our uh, emotion. For the majority of people in this country, Planned Parenthood is not the problem. We're the solution. And you better believe we're here to fight for reproductive rights, including access to safe and legal abortion. Reproductive justice fights for access to safe and healthy and legal abortion. Because having an abortion is not a sin. It is not genocide. It is our human right. Are you a boy or are you a girl? The simple answer is no. What? It's what you feel that defines you. So just remember, gender is what you feel, not what your parts are. Monitoring groups say they're the telltale signs of a chemical attack. According to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, at least 58 people were killed, among them 11 children under the age of eight. Well, I always have to remind people that literalism is a very new phenomenon. I mean, in the 2000 year history of the Gospels, it's only been a hundred years in which Christians have read them as literal and inerrant. That might come as a shock to a lot of Christians because they think that, well, this is how the Gospels were always read. That's not true. I'm sorry, no, there's a mistake. There's a mistake. Moonlight, best picture. But my real contribution, the reason why I'm here, is to help connect people to themselves and the higher ideas of consciousness. I'm here to help raise consciousness. So my television platform was to help raise consciousness. Wow. Cultural confusion, cultural complexity, cultural controversial controversy, cultural fine-sounding arguments, that creates a lot of ministry strain. So do you feel prepared to help church members and people that come into your counseling office? Do you feel prepared to help others engage in constructive conversations with people who disagree on matters like we just saw up here on the screen. Do you think any of us are prepared to have grace-filled conversations about these issues? Grace-filled conversations seasoned with salt. Are we prepared to know how to answer anyone? Hmm. That's one of the strains of ministry for all of us right now. It's a strain for me. The reality is that about 70% of the people in the United States self-identify as Christians, but only about 8% now fall in the category of evangelicals. So, what does that mean? That means those of us that are in the evangelical category are on the fringe, and we are seeing more and more that religious freedoms lack value in the wider U.S. population. So the strain is how do we influence a culture when we've been relegated to the margins and are considered either irrelevant or even intolerant? How can we be salt and light when our influence has waned? So here's what I'm dealing with right now. Uh, we're working on a new study in Bible Study Fellowship, kind of a revised version, and it's called People of the Promised Land, and it begins with Joshua. So uh, I'm working on these materials that we will supply to our Bible study classes. And so Joshua, the conquest of Canaan, and God says, okay, go out, the, the, the Canaanites are ripe for judgment, Go out and wipe them all out. Wipe out all the women and all the children. And then I turn on my news and I see this chemical attack in Syria on these innocent children. Now, how do we reconcile that as we teach the book, book of Joshua? How do we speak about God and judgment in the face of this destruction of the innocents in Syria? 
I mean, that creates a lot of ministry strain for me. Another thing, cities of refuge. I just taught something on cities of refuge in Joshua. Well, is that the same thing as sanctuary cities in the United States? I mean, how do, how do we answer these questions that thinking people will answer? So when you consider the social, the economic, the moral, the legal complexity of our times, accelerated by the digital world and 24-hour news, man, does that create ministry strain. Ministry strain. So cultural strain, then uh, church and other kinds of ministry strain. Uh, we are called to minister. That means to meet the needs, to attend to the needs of other people. So what do we have? We have singles absolutely battling the sexual expectations of the day. We have husbands and fathers dealing with addictions. We have mothers and wives dealing with depression. Add to that all the issues that parents face of raising children today, of losing children, of not having children when their hearts long for them, then the caring for agent, aging parents, and all that amidst the daily demands of jobs and a 4G pace. That's the people that are in your counseling offices and in, and in, your, um, in your congregations or will be. And those issues are not just their issues. I mean, they're my issues, too. They're your issues. They're, they're all of our issues. We all have this brokenness that we're dealing with. And so how do broken people minister to these, these incredibly deep needs that people have? Pastors need ministry partners to help with all those needs. But instead, ministry problems tend to be the order of the day. That creates a ton of strain, a ton of strain. And it's not just the hurting church members or the people that come into other aspects of your ministry life, but it's right in your office. I mean, I can tell you Bible Study Fellowship headquarters is not heaven on earth. I bet DTS is not heaven on earth either, and I can guarantee you that your church office won't be either. And all that brings strain, strain. And then there is the strain, I believe, an added strain for women. Ministry jobs for women have increased tremendously, all kinds of ministry. But only 11% of, of pastors are women today. And so for all of my sisters out here in uh, this room, um, do you wonder where will you find a place for your spiritual gifting and for your seminary training? Do you ask yourself that question? Will there be a place for you to flourish in ministry? Maybe you have a place now. Will that continue to exist? And so that unanswered question may create some additional strain for you. And I understand that. I started practicing law in 1975. I was the only woman in my law firm. And some of the partners were very mad that I had been hired. And in fact, when I first started working, I had been hired to be a litigator because I thought I could talk, you know? So I, I, I chose litigation. But when I got there, I found out that the litigation department had had a late night vote and they were not gonna have a woman in their division. So by the sovereignty of God, and I praise the Lord for it, I ended up in, in the corporate law department and I needed all that for what I was gonna do as the leader of Bible Study Fellowship. So God knew what he was doing, but there was some disappointment and strain for me in those days. Mark said that I, I stepped out of the practice of law, reduced that a lot, and was, became very involved in parenting And uh, when our children came. And then um, my husband and I served overseas. In fact, Scott Harrell was there when we were there in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And, um, and after six years in Brazil, we came back, and my pastor at that time said, Susie, you have got to go to seminary. And you know what I said to him? No way. <laughs> No way. I have fought the battles of a woman in law, which those battles are over now pretty much, you know. But I, I said, been there, done that, not going back to fighting the strain of a woman in a man's world. So, so for all you women, <laughs> I know there is additional <coughs> ministry strain. I'm not speaking about the theology. I'm just speaking about the reality, okay? So.
understanding the strain that all of you face as men and women um, in your personal lives, uh, in your ministry lives and the ministry lives to come, and then this just this huge cultural complexity that we find ourselves in. It is critical for you to have strain survival solutions. Okay, so that's what I want to talk to you about. Strain survival solutions. With the right solutions in place, you are and will increasingly be to Jesus, to me, to all your teachers here at, Bible, at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. You will be, and, and you are becoming what I believe are heroes of the faith like those in Hebrews 11. If you learn to survive the strain of ministry through all the energy that Christ so powerfully works in you, then through faith you will conquer kingdoms, you will administer justice, you will gain what is promised, and you will shut the mouths of the cultural lions with gentleness and truth. Amen. And you'll do that all while facing the strains of ministry. You are absolutely indispensable. And so let's be sure you know how to survive those strains. Lots of, lots of solutions to strain, uh, but I'm gonna talk about three of them. I'm gonna talk about first the soul solution, which must be first. And then I'm gonna talk about the story solution. And then lastly, I'm gonna talk about shared solution. So, soul solution. Colossians 2.6 says, so then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. You are in Christ, and we must never forget that. And we must cultivate all that means. We must learn to partake of Christ in all of his fullness in the midst of, of all the strains that are coming. He is your identity, and never forget that you are already holy and blameless in his sight. Never forget that he is your protector, your strength, your wisdom, your counselor, and your shepherd. And never forget that it is your intimacy with him and the maturity he brings in your lives that will help you to minister out of his grace, out of his fullness, to help people that come with these broken lives into your midst. So the sole solution is intimacy with God. And I know you talk about that every day and you're coming and going, but that has to be number one. Now, strain on pastors and other ministry leaders can manifest in itself in many, many ways. It can manifest in addictions, in depression, in unfaithfulness, in emotional exhaustion, and in isolation. That's one of the ways ministry strain can manifest. But there is another way. Ministry strain can also manifest in hope, in growth in Christ-likeness, and in joy, in joy. That's why Paul writes in Colossians, I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you. So how does that happen? It's the nearness of Jesus, it's the comfort of Jesus, and all that brings out such spiritual riches in your life and they just overpower the poverty of life. So that's the number one, soul solution. Then there's the story solution. So Paul is in prison, he, um, Epaphras, comes to him. Now, Epaphras is from Colossae. He's a ministry partner of Paul's. And, and Epaphras has been in Colossae, and he's shared the gospel. And thanks be to God, by the Spirit, a new church has been planted. And so Epaphras goes back to Rome, where Paul's in prison, and he says, Paul, you won't believe what's happened. You just won't believe what's happened. There's a new church full of new believers in my hometown of Colossae. And what does Paul say? He says, tell me the stories. Tell me the stories of every person in Colossae. Tell me how God worked in each one of their lives. Tell me how the Spirit brought them together to form a church. Paul was sustained in prison because of the stories of God's miraculous grace in the lives of people. He was like a starving man. He wanted to savor every morsel of the stories God was writing in people's life. And as he heard them, he rejoiced at the power of the gospel. And so he says, I rejoice for what I am suffering for you. 
So that's the story solution. To pause to listen, to savor, and to share the stories of what God is doing in the lives of his people. The story solution. So at church on Sunday, at church on Sunday, this woman comes up to me and she says, Susie, I've got to tell you a story of something that happened in Bible Study Fellowship. And I said, great, I, I, I want to hear the story. And so she said, I know someone who is leading a ministry for women who are victims of sex trafficking. And so she's leading this support ministry. And there were two women, and, and she said, you know, the, the, the ministry leader goes to a Bible Study Fellowship class. And she said, you know, I, I I'm kind of thinking, Lord, about taking two of these women with me. And she said, I'm not sure BSF is the place for sex traffic victims. But by faith, she took them. And so prayerfully, uh, these two women um, victims were placed in a group of just a regular Bible study fellowship group with maybe 12 women in it. And they don't share their story. Okay, they don't share their story. They're just kind of getting to know people. Two or three weeks later, a woman... Another woman in that very same group of 12 women or so, she begins to share that she was a victim of sex trafficking. And these two women hadn't even shared their stories. Can you imagine? They cried together. They shared together. They began a healing process together. I know for sure that one of these women has already come to faith in Jesus Christ and said, I've never felt so cared or so loved for in that Bible study fellowship class. Now, that keeps me going. <laughs> Do you understand? I deal with a lot of problems that any ministry leader does. But, I mean, when I hear stories like that, I say, oh my goodness, Lord, it is worth it. It is worth it. It is worth it. So, the sole solution, the story solution. And then lastly, the shared solution. Shared solution. Ministry is to be shared. None of us are meant to go it alone. We know that, don't we? And so the shared solution can involve partnerships with other ministries like Bible Study Fellowship. So the Barna Group recently re released its 2017 report on the state of pastors. And it said this. All in all, it appears that a relatively strong web of connections, both to denominational networks and to other loyal communities of faith, often correlates to church health and pastoral health, suggesting that pastors and network leaders should consider how to fortify and extend these partnerships. Sharing the joys and burdens of ministries, the responsibilities, it reduces the strain. It is a survival solution for all of us. The church pours into Bible study fellowship. My pastor poured into me on Sunday. This woman that shared at church poured into me on Sunday. And Bible study fellowship desires to return that to you. So, this Barner report tells us what are the number one and two frustrations for ministry leaders. The number one frustration is lack of commitment among lay people to share the load, okay? And the Barna Report then says the number two frustration is low level of spiritual maturity among churchgoers. Bible Study Fellowship can help lift that frustration from you. We desire to serve you. We desire to magnify the Lord and mature his people alongside you. So what do we do? We do Bible classes, Bible classes for men and women and children. We have base classes and satellite classes in over 44 countries, hundreds, hundreds in um, the United States, actually thousands in the United States, so many here in Dallas, hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children coming to BSF this week, this week. So we teach the Bible. The other thing we do is we train spiritual leaders for the church. We train spiritual leaders for the church. We were formed 58 years ago by pastors who said we need some help. We need some help. And so over 58 years of prayerful ministry, Bible Study Fellowship has developed some best practices in teaching the Bible and also in training spiritual leaders for the church. Because we intend to produce passionate commitment to Christ, to his word, and to his church. That is our mission. 
So we have 10 studies, five Old Testament and five New, that some in this room are pouring themselves into, including many other theologians. And what do we do? How do we partner with the church? So many ways, but one thing is we meet in churches. So I thought you'd just like to see a little video of what a local church pastor put on his website about BSF. Hey, Cottonwood Creek, this is Will Chapman, the internet minister. Uh, from time to time on Wednesdays, we have people that'll come uh, by our facility and they'll see all these cars and all these people uh, that's, that uh, are around and, and going inside the building and coming outside the building and things like that. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of a behind the scenes look to see who these people really are. What this group is, is that this is the Women's Bible Study Fellowship of uh, the McKinney Allen uh, area. It's a group of uh, interdenominational uh, women who get together uh, uh, for Bible study, uh, for singing, for a uh, small group application uh, discussion, things like that. And uh, we've been hosting them now for several, several years, but there are a whole lot of them that come up and show up here uh, on any given Wednesday. So uh, we appreciate uh, the opportunity that we have in, in hosting uh, BSF. And uh, we just wanted to let you know a little bit more about what goes on here around Cottonwood Creek. Uh, don't forget, we have worship service, uh, our new midweek worship service tonight at 6.30 to 7.30 here in the atrium. If you can make it out, we'd love to see you. Hey, man, I love that. A commercial for us, a commercial for him. <laughs> uh, so churches are our partners, and I just wanted you to know that we would love to be involved with you as you continue in your ministry. I want you to know that innovation is the word of the day in Bible Study Fellowship. We are, we are all focused on bridging in-depth Bible study from one generation to the next. Uh, we have all kinds of new models. In fact, D Janie Stevens, one of, your, uh, one of the students here, is leading um, our model here in Dallas, a new young adult model. Uh, last night, we started our second virtual uh, BSF class online, um, and so we are doing and all we can and we are committed to facing forward to reach this generation and the generations of the future and we are committed to facing outward to impact the culture with culturally relevant and engaging resources so that's what we intend to do we were really encouraged when Navigators did a study on the state of discipleship and we ordered a copy of the book and we were so excited that we were listed in the 10 ministries that are the most effective discipleship ministries in the United States. And we were really excited when we saw pastors and other church leaders ranked us as seventh on that list. But then we were astounded when we saw that when all Christians were polled, Bible Study Fellowship was ranked as the number one organization enabling discipleship. And so what I'm telling you is we can help you reduce the strain of ministry as one of your partners. We can help you with trained lay leaders for your church. And how do I know that for sure? Because as we do our own surveys, 80% of BSF class members all over the world serve in their church. 80% of them are serving in some job in their church, and 40% of them are ministry leaders. Ministry leaders, they're teaching Sunday school, they're on your committees, they're your pastors, or your, your deacons and your elders. So, BSF can really help you with the strain of ministry. Ministry strain is under unavoidable. We are certainly remembering this as we think of Jesus in this Passion Week. It's inevitable for you, and it's intensified by a culture that marginalizes you just as Jesus was marginalized. And ministry strain will manifest itself in your life, it will, either in destructive ways or in hope and in joy and in Christ-likeness. For that latter to happen, ministry strain needs solutions. Seek first his kingdom, that's the sole solution. Tell his stories, tell his stories. Savor them, pause to reflect on them, share them as I did this morning. And then lastly, sh search for shared solutions for partners that can help you in your ministry. And when you need a partner to help you, remember Bible Study Fellowship. We desire to serve you.
Thank you so much for letting me be here. Let me just close in prayer. Lord, as I look out at these partners in the gospel, Lord, uh, I know they're under strain right now. You know the strains that I'm under. I think of Mark Bailey, the strains that he's under as the leader of DTS. And so, Father, I pray that you would give us your solutions for strain survival, that we could continue to be all that you've called us to be, and that through faith, we would see your kingdom advanced in the, in the midst of a very complex culture. I pray it in Christ's name, amen. God bless you all, it's a privilege. <laughs>